As my good friend Neil Armstrong would have said, that's a small step for some of these splendid chaps. It's a very large one for me. <laughs> so I've come in the back door, so to speak. President of the Royal Aeronautical Society, President and Chairman of the branch, Yeovilson branch of the Society. Ladies and gentlemen, and may I say to many of you, dear friends, it is a delight to see you come tonight to support me in this lecture. It's given in my name, and I'm happy to say it's not called, as it usually is, the Memorial Lecture. <laughs> but I still have, on these occasions, the day before the lecture, there is always a phone call saying, you know, uh, you're all set for tomorrow. What they're really saying is, are you upright still? And uh, of course, I'm happy to say I am. Now, before I start, can you hear at the back okay? Fine, thank you. No distortion? Right, good. Right, if I may start, I've got a crib here. It's not a crib of what I'm going to say. It's a crib of the order of the slides. They're in chronological order. And um, I'm going to start the first highlight without a slide. Now, what is a highlight? Something that makes the adrenaline flow. Something you will probably never forget. And the first real highlight in my life goes back to 1936, when I was in Berlin for the Olympic Games. And I met and was taken under the wing of the Nazi general, Ernst Udet, who was then the top aerobatic flyer in the world. And also, of course, the second highest combat scorer in World War II after Richthofen. And he said to me, would you like to have a flight with me? Uh, at an airfield nearby called Halle, and I said, I'd love that. Um, don't ask me why he locked on to me, as a, I was only 17 at the time, but my father was there as a RFC pilot, and he agreed I should do this. So we went up in a thing called a Booker Jungmann, which is rather like a, a rather nippy, Tiger Moss. I was in the front and he in the back. He took great trouble to strap me in. And I soon found out why. Because he did every aerobatic I have ever heard of. And I was holding on to my stomach. But after quite a session, I didn't toss my cookies, and we came in to land. As we approached, he turned the aircraft over onto its back, and we kept on approaching down to the runway. And I really thought this was my demise. I thought he's had a heart attack. <laughs> but no, when we got near the runway, and we probably just had enough height, obviously we had, for the span of the aircraft. He turned it over, and we flopped onto the runway. He came forward to my cockpit, and uh, he spoke rather poor English, and my German at that time was almost schoolboy German, but we managed. And um, he said to me, you know, I think you'd make a good fighter pilot. And he slapped me on the back and said, Haus und Beinbruch. Now that, that is the fighter pilot's greeting for World War I pilots. 
Hals und Beinbruch, which means break your neck and break your legs. Typical pilot's greeting. And uh, the thing, the highlight about all this was that he, on the way back, driving home, he said to me, you know, I'd like you to try and achieve two goals in life. One, become a pilot. Secondly, learn to speak German. So I set myself these two goals and they paid me tremendous dividends. I next met Odette in 1938. Could I have the first slide, please? And he was with the famous German lady aviatrix, Hannah Reich. Now, Hannah Reich at that stage was the world's top glider pilot. And she was persuaded by Udet to fly the, f the helicopter, one of the first helicopters that had been built in Germany, the Focke-Wolf 61. And she was going to demonstrate it in what's called the Deutschlandhalle, which is probably like Els Court. And uh, there was a big um, motor show going on and uh, there were about well over 5,000 people in the audience. And she was going to lift off, demonstrate hovering, going backwards, turning on, on a point, etc. And when she had practiced this, we had rehearsals, no problems. But when the time came, um, she got in the cockpit, revved up the engine, and the thing would only lift about six inches off the ground. And uh, Udet was absolutely shattered. But there was a young man present, I don't know who he was, but he said, do you know, I think the problem is, this is a normally aspirated engine, requires air and he said this place is full of 5,000 people all sucking in the air let's open the hangar doors so to speak and see if it works as soon as we did that Hannah leapt up to 30 feet and demonstrated the helicopter to muted applause because the ladies were not amused. Hats were going everywhere, hairdos were standing on end, and um, as I said, not the most popular demonstration, but highly successful. Anyway, I came back to the UK, and remembering what Udet said, joined Edinburgh University Air Squadron. There I flew my first military type. Now that is the Gloucester Gauntlet. This was the era of the biplanes, a golden era, when we had things like the Hawker Fury, the Gloucester Gauntlet, of course, here, the Gloucester Gladiator, and the Italians, of course, had the Fiat CR-42. And uh, these were all magnificent airplanes, which were happier upside down than they were flying the right way up. They were all aerobatic gems. A very good way to start your life in them. Now the next thing happened was I went, war had a broken out, and I moved on to Netherraven to do my flying training. And there the seriousness of war was certainly brought home to me because one day we were sitting on the grass in the sunshine 
and um, the pilots under training, all chattering away. And one of our people were going around, was going around the circuit in a hawker heart. Suddenly another aircraft came along, flew alongside him, and to our horror, there was a Messerschmitt 110, rear gunner opened up, and the next minute the heart was in flames, and our fellow pilot plunged to the ground. It brought home a point, if you're going to be a fighter pilot, you better have a neck like a falcon, prepared to rotate all the time, look around and see if anybody is approaching you from a difficult direction. Next one, please. Now this is the skewer. And it was given to the fleet air arm as a dual purpose aircraft. Firstly a fighter, secondly a dive bomber. A fighter it was not, a dive bomber it was very good. Not up to let's say the German JU-87, but nevertheless, very good, very accurate. Now, I went on my first, so, uh, my first operational flight to bomb the oil tanks at Bergen, uh, operating out of Hatston in the Orkneys. Long haul over the North Sea in a weak mixture. And you can just make it there and back. When we got there, all clear, we went up to 7,000 feet, dive bombed very successfully, and were skipping on our way home up the field when a clutch of 109 Fs arrived. Message with 109 Fs. And they set about us. Well, the reason I'm telling you this was I discovered a trick. I thought, here we go. And uh, I got tight into the fjord wall. So I thought, he can only attack me from one side. Got really low down on the water, so he couldn't attack me from beneath. And um, the only way was from the rear, and I had a, a gunner with one Vickers 303. Not much of a defense, but better than nothing. And I said to my tag, tell me when he opens fire. And uh, he called and he said, I see flashes now. So as soon as he said that, I popped the dive brakes on the skewer. And believe you me, this German pilot got the shock of his life because he was almost up our tail before he got his wits together. And he was lucky to get away with it. And so were we, of course. But we were happy boys. And it's a nice way to use your dive brakes other than dive bombing. Right, now, next one, please. I can't see the black so dusty, isn't it? Yes. Now here, let me see. No, no, this is uh, nine. Um, when I was in my first real fighter squadron, squadron of wildcats, or martlets as they were then called, operating out of Donny Bristol in 1940. Um, we had this lovely lease land aircraft. But one thing it didn't have was full body harness. It only had a lap strap. And of course, for deck landing, this isn't much good because the deceleration projects you forward and you've got a gun sight staring you in the face. So we all had to fly our aircraft individually to Croydon to get a modified, lapse, a modified harness. On the way, 
I was in the Yorkshire area, Lincolnshire area, when I ran into very bad weather and called into Cranwell. And very glad I was to get in there. But to my astonishment, this RAF station had more civilians walking around it than it had RAF personnel. I wondered what was going on, spoke to many of the civilians and said, you know, why were they there? There was a huge air of conspiracy. Nobody would say why they were there. They weren't there for the holidays, obviously, but they weren't going to tell me why. I shared a room with one that night and um, again, nothing. But next day, the air traffic control asked me if I'd make a series of weather tests just to check cloud-based visibility, etc. And I did three of these and on the third, I said, well, it's not bad. Um, I'd be prepared to fly within 20 miles of here. And then the reason for the whole secrecy revealed itself. The hangar doors opened and out came strangest aircraft I had ever seen. Um, it was, of course, the Gloucester E-2839. And this was Britain's first jet. And the date, I mean, not, ah, uh, this was Britain's first jet. I was, let me just say that again. The door, the hangar doors opened and out came this strange aircraft, no propeller. And the um, date was 15th of May, 1941. And uh, this was Britain's first jet, the E-2839. I saw it take off around about seven o'clock in the evening for a 20 minute flight. And there was a man there, a wing commander, who seemed to be the main factotum. I had no idea who he was, but later he was to play a very large part in my life. He was called Frank Whittle. And of course, um, this was the first jet, as I said, of Britain. And Frank Whittle was the real inventor or developer, if you rather use the word, of the jet engine. He and I were to meet up much a little later in life and have a, a, a working together for the least 25 to 30 years. Anyway, I'm going to have the next. Then I was posted to my first operational carrier, HMS Audacity. Tiny escort carrier, the tiniest one ever built. And the first. It was so small, there was no room for a hangar. We had at first six martlets and eventually eight. But they were all positioned permanently on the deck. And uh, when one flew off, uh, the deck length, of course, had been restricted by the, by the aircraft parked at the rear. We had about 300 odd feet for takeoff. And um, there were three wires, the rest of wires, two normally, and one emergency wire, which, if you caught it, decelerated you very quickly and also collapsed the barrier at the same time. Needless to say, it was not known as the emergency wire to us. It was called the for Christ's sake wire. <laughs> well, there we go. And um, many a time it was used, I fear, on, the, on these occasions. Now, Audacity distinguished itself 
it did um, four convoys of a sunk on the fourth on the 21st of December 1941. But in its short lifetime, it had it destroyed five Fokker Wolf four engine Condors or couriers as they were known in the military guys and assisted in the destruction of five U-boats. And it so disturbed Grand Admiral Dönitz, who was head of U-boat command, that he gave a special briefing to the German high command on the effect of this escort carrier on U-boat operations. Hitler listened to this and was so perturbed by what he heard that he ordered the Graf Zeppelin, on which work had been halted, for the work to recommence and for three auxiliary carriers to be built and a naval air service to be started up. So this was a huge impact. Now let's have a look at the aircraft itself, the Wildcat. Remarkable aircraft, really. A leased land, but built specifically for naval operations. And there were many interesting features. Probably first and foremost, the most interesting from our point of view was it was very easy to deck land because it had a sting hook coming out of the tail instead of the belly hook under, obviously under the belly. And uh, this type of hook is a little difficult to, uh, if if you come in in anything but the perfect three-point attitude to pick up a wire. With a sting hook, very easy indeed. The other great feature, instead of 0.303 machine guns, we were given the powerful American, six of them, 0.5 inch guns. And this is a powerful, very powerful blast. Also, in many British fighters, particularly those with eight three or threes, stoppages were usual. And when a gun, one out of eight stops, you get an asymmetric uh, force, of course. But with our 0.5s, if one stopped, we had re-cocking handles in the cockpit. We could reach down, re-cock the gun immediately. Huge advantage. And the other big thing which were, made the pilots very happy was wonderful flotation bags would pop out of the wings if you landed on the water, it only needed two inches of water to actuate a hydrostatic valve and these huge bags would pop out of each wing. And usually if you just sat in the cockpit till the rest you came, you would barely even get your feet wet. They, so all in all, we were a very happy bunch of bunnies, I tell you on that. Now, let me show you our opponent, the Fokker Wolf 200, the Condor. At this stage in the war, this was the heaviest armed aircraft in the world. It was loaded with turrets, four turrets, and 20 millimeter and 15 millimeter cannon as well as loads of 0 0.30. I, I, the very first engagement we had with this on, 
I think it was the first or the second, we lost this, our commanding officer was shot down. And uh, I found out he had been making a quarter attack when he was shot down by the upper turret. So I looked at these turrets and really looked very carefully to see if I could work out what maximum deflection and elevation you could get without shooting bits of their own aeroplane off. Obviously they had stops on them to prevent this. But having worked it out, or at least thought I'd got it right, I realised the only way of attacking this thing was flat, and I mean dead flat. Not a dive down onto the, the pilot's cockpit, but coming in absolutely flat. And they couldn't get at you with their turrets. And it was a bit hair raising. You're coming in at very high speed, closing with this huge thing. Clearly see the pilots, and indeed I could see the windscreen, their windscreen shattering under my 6.5 guns. And uh, the pilots were obviously killed there and then. And um, I had the good luck to be able to dispose of two by this system. And the other pilots latched onto it too. And as I say, we destroyed a total of five on, in uh, that particular sortie. Right, now we'll have a look at another aircraft of this time. The Grumman Hellcat. This was the daddy of the Wildcat, really, successor. And the bigger airplane, by daddy I mean bigger in size. Wonderful machine, and operated mainly in the Far East, but with great success, because out there, the skies had been ruled by the Mitsubishi Zero. The Zero literally ruled the skies in the Far East for three and a half years. It was a very light aircraft. It had no armor for the pilot, no bulletproof windscreen. I'm talking about the Zero, not the Hellcat. Um, no, uh, no bulletproof windscreen. No self-sealing tanks. So the pilot was in, you couldn't even jettison the hood. The Japanese philosophy here was, you pilots are in there to fight to the death. And don't forget it. You're in, that's why you are like it is. But of course, without these heavy things like armor, they had tremendous low weight, giving them huge maneuverability. And that is what made them so difficult to deal with. The Hellcat changed all that. You wonder why, because immediately you attacked a zero, it just went into a raking turn. Uh, and I really mean a raking turn. But with the Hellcat, provided you had at least 1,500 feet, and you were diving down on the zero, it picked up speed very heavily in the dive. When you got down to the zero, you had so much speed that you could pull the thing round as tight as the zero for a third of the total turn, only a third. But during that third, if you got a bead on the zero and fired with your 6.5s and this thinly skinned zero, it would blow it to bits. And as a result, at the end of World War II, the Grumman Hellcat had the highest combat kill rate of any aircraft during the war. Kill rate of 19 to 1. Can compare that, for example, with the Zero, which was 12 to 1. Or the Corsair, 
which was about 10 to 1. So that was a remarkable, remarkable aircraft. Now, we talked about Audacity as an escort carrier. This was the brainchild of Churchill. He had his finger in that pot. But his first brainchild in the Battle of the Atlantic was the catapult of the cat ship. And uh, this meant having a catapult fitted to merchant ships and a hurricane fighter, or sometimes it was even a fulmar, on, set on, on the catapult. The pilot, with, there would be two pilots aboard, they would share the daylight hours sitting in the cockpit, ready to go. But since there was nowhere to go if you were shot off, and nowhere to land, that's to say, you never were fired off unless a condor was actually visual, sighted. So in the whole of its use, it only had two successful kills, but it was a deterrent. And uh, we know that it did worry Dönitz, not too much, but it caused him a little bit of a flutter. Now I had to, when I went to Farnborough as a test pilot, one of the first jobs I had was dealing with upping the kind of aircraft on a cat fighter. Instead of the Hurricane, certainly instead of the Fulmar, which were a bit slow, even for the Condor, we decided to use the Seafire. And uh, I did the catapult trials at Farnborough, and during a series of these, I noticed a wing commander standing, watching, he watched about half a dozen of these. And afterwards, when I finished, got out the aircraft, he came over to me, and I suddenly recognized it was Frank Whittle. And he said, I am very interested in catapulting because when I was a test pilot at the Marine establishment at Felixstowe, I had a lot of catapulting to do. So he, we had a chat about this. And of course, as I say, I had a long association with him afterwards. Then we had another visitor to watch the same sort of thing later. And the buzz went up that the great man himself, Winston Churchill, was coming to watch. So we got all prepared for the day. And um, you'll see it shot off on a... I better bring this with me. Oh, I'll talk to you. Uh, it was shot off on a, a cradle, and the cradle ran along grooves and it had two spikes at the front and they went into two tubes. They are along here. Filled with water. Nothing more or less than that. Only eight to ten feet long. And they could arrest the cradle and as they, it did so, of course, the sea fire was thrown off. Well, as I say, on this next time, we had Winston Churchill coming. Great excitement. And the guy... <laughs> it's what? All right. The guy who filled the tubes was an Irishman. And you'll never believe this, he was called Murphy. <laughs> you know Murphy's Law. And he was in a high state of excitement that the great man was coming. And in a moment of aberration, he forgot to fill the tubes with water. Here's the result. Could you? <laughs> Well,
Well, the, 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 the cradle eventually did fall away, but, but it was full power across the airfield to keep going with it. And the funny thing is Winston Churchill applauded. He didn't realize anything unusual had taken place. So there we go. Now, early in 1943, the boffins at Farnborough were thinking well ahead and were thinking of the problem of breaking the sound barrier. Now, Farnborough was the first ever to experiment with transonic flight. And this was, they started in October 1941. The airplane they used was the Spitfire 5. With that airplane, you could get up to Mach numbers of about 0.75. But that was as far as it would go, because it couldn't climb high enough and to give us the thing that we wanted. But when the Spit 9 came along, the whole scenario changed and we could really start getting high max numbers. And um, to give you an idea of what a difference it made, we moved from the 0.75 sort of era up to, well, I did a dive in the Spit 9 to 0.88. And uh, so we were getting along. And um, the stick forces in such a dive were of the order of 100 to 120 pounds. You had to be pretty fit to cope with this. Indeed, usually we screwed the throttle tight, locked the throttle tight and used both hands on the stick. It was, of course, you know, a spade grip stick. And you could get both hands on it. We proceeded with this, and um, my, I was in a high-speed flight at farm at this time. And my boss was one, a gentleman, squad leader, Tony Martindale. Now, Martindale was a much bigger chap than me. He was about 6'2", and weighed 16 stone. And uh, he went up in a flight one day in the Spit 11. We had changed from the Spit 9 to the 11 for this reason. The 9 had gun ports, of course, and uh, holes there which gave drag, whereas the PR 11 had, uh, were smooth wings. And um, he went up to 43,000 feet, dived and uh, was diving to 26,000. When he started to pull out at 26,000, when, as he pulled out, there was a tremendous bang and the air screw came off along with the front part of the engine and he was subjected to 11G. Now how do we know all this? Because in the aircraft we carried an automatic observer. And 11G theoretically should have broken the Spitfire because its limit was 7G plus factored up to 10 maximum. Anyway, when he came up, when he came to, he was back up at 40 odd thousand, and he called the airfield, and um, I was on the radio because we operated our own system then, and he said, told me roughly what had happened, and he said, I can't see out much, but um, when I pull, wind the windscreen back, um, I can see Farnborough. He said, I, if I can get the other carriage down, I'm going to try a forced landing. And 
he made it, and here is the aircraft. Oh, sorry, that's the M50. Could we go on one? And again. There is the aircraft. And you can see the large part of the nose that is missing. And when you cannot see, but at the wing roots, which are in the shadow there, there was a gap of three inches uh, between the wing and the fuselage. In other words, he had swept back the wings of the Spitfire <laughs> at, 11, at 11 G. That is the, the max number that was achieved was 0.92, which is the highest ever achieved by a piston engine aircraft and remains so to this day. Now, could you go back and we, and Mr. Officer, and again. Now, I told you we were interested in transonic flight and, uh, of course, above all, in supersonic flight. And in 1943, the Boffins at Farnborough actually drew up a specification for a supersonic research aircraft called the Miles M52. Why was Miles chosen? Reasonably insignificant little company, but they had shown tremendous initiative in many of their aircraft designs. And they were the only company in the UK at that time that didn't have its order books full for the war effort. So, the specification was drawn up no, but for the Miles M52, and it had some unusual features. You your hat. All right, thank you, thank you. I tell you what these quietly are. Well, um, it had a biconvex wing, which was so thin that if you didn't wear gloves you would cut yourself if you touched the trailing edges. Of course, fundamentally, the way to get supersonic flight is massive power and extremely thin wings. This had that, the biconvex wing, and that the tail, you don't see it here because it's not fitted up to that time, was the flying tail. Now, the flying tail is the way, really, to control an airplane in supersonic flight. Because you don't have the tailplane and the elevator, you have a solid piece, and it all moves together. And uh, so that was the flying tail. We had a huge engine virtually two en jet engines which reheat, joined together. And it also had a pilot capsule. I'm getting a thing. Not to worry, you see the pilot capsule right up front here. Now, I was chosen to fly this aircraft. Part of the reason was I was in the high-speed flight at Par Farnborough, but another part of it was I was about the only pilot around that could get into this damn thing <laughs> because the cockpit diameter was only four feet. Uh, and uh, the prospects Many people thought we'd bitten off more than we could chew. But the, truth, the proof of the pudding is, we eventually dropped a model of this aircraft and it, with a little rocket-powered engine in it, and it achieved a Mach number of 1.38. 
However, the sad thing is, all that was after the British or our government decided to cancel this and told us to give all the data, everything, every paper and indeed hardware if they wanted it, to return it to the United States. We now have found out the huge amount of money, we believe, changed hands. And uh, this country was broke at the end of the war, bankrupt virtually, and an offer of this probably was an offer that couldn't be refused. Anyway, we gave it all to the Americans and they used it. Chuck Yeager would never have got through the sound barrier if he hadn't had the flying tail. No question about that at all. And um, I was, did I consider it a high, a high risk project? The answer is not really, not really. Um, for example, I don't consider, didn't consider it as high risk a project as Andy Green's going to do on this thousand mile an hour car. But there we go. That's up to them. Next, could you go? Yes, next slide. Now, probably the most difficult job I've ever had in test flying was to um, land Mosquito Mark 6, the bomber version, on an aircraft carrier. The problems were these. Speed. The stalling speed of the Mosquito, with all everything down, flaps, undercarriage, etc., was 110 miles an hour. I was told that to achieve a deck, successful deck landing on the carrier, my maximum engagement speed with the arrestor gear was to be 83 miles an hour. 8310. It's a lot to find. Second thing was weight. The greatest weight that had been landed on a carrier to date had been 10,000 pounds. That was the Grumman event. They said that we were going to take this aircraft up to 20,000 pounds. Double weight. Third problem was this was a wooden airplane. Would the hook tear the fuselage apart when it engaged with the rest of gear. The other problem was that when we did the experiments, I realized the only way to try and get anywhere near the speed they demanded was normally with a mosquito on land, you come into land at 125 miles an hour, what about minus two pounds boost on your engines? I found the only way to get down to the speeds they required was to have plus four pounds boost on and hang on the props. However, in the event of an engine failure, hanging in this stage with these four-bladed experimental props, which could not be feathered. And when we had checked on at height, simulating the situation, plus four pounds on each engine, and up to uh, about 90 miles an hour, and then cut an engine, the mozzie inverted itself in one and a half seconds. So, 
an engine failure or even an engine hiccup on the approach in this experiment would have been fatal. However, that risk had to be taken because we, this was all being devised for a sort of dam busters raid in Japan. So I consider that really the most difficult job I've ever had to do. My actual speed here on landing was 78 miles an hour. So we achieved it, but I was, as I say, hanging on the props till I got about three feet above the deck when I cut the throttles and it fell like a sack of coal onto the deck. Right, let's go on a bit. Um, Next one, please. Next. Here you have the Halifax. One of our foremost bombers at the time. Now, we got reports from Bomber Command that the Halifax got into severe difficulties during corkscrew maneuvers. Now, what this means is, when you're flying over Germany and a, the searchlights get onto you, the only way to get rid of them is start a corkscrew maneuver, which means diving down, pulling up, and going over the top and going down again, trying to avoid the searchlights. Now, when you picked up speed, gone up, okay. But when you come down at the bottom of that, when you're going to start again, you have to use full rudder to get round the corner. And we got numerous actual first class reports from the bomber crews, mainly the tail gunners that they had seen the Halifaxes go in like this, into a spin, and that was it. So, the Halifax at that time had a fin and rudder which were triangular of this ship. If you look at any early Halifaxes, you will see that. This is not so in this. We did the trials and decided the problem was with the fin and rudder, and we had to increase the area and make a rectangular instead of a triangular uh, shape. Now, I practiced this for a while, and we did it at dusk. Why not at night? We did it at dusk because we needed to photograph it all. And, um, we had, once we got the new shape, we had perfected it all. So I was told that we were going to lay on a demonstration for Bomber Command. They were going to send a representative who would fly with me, and um, he would not handle the controls. I would have a second pilot from REE with me and my own flight engineer. But when we got ready for the night, the army was lined up to have searchlights, etc. And when the representative appeared, to my utter astonishment, it was the VC Leonard Cheshire. Very, probably the most highly decorated pilot that was around. He stood just behind my seat where we had a special harness for him and he just held the back of my seat and we went through about three or four of these maneuvers just as I expected from Cheshire cool, calm, collected, not a word was said so finally when we finished I thought I'd better say something to him so I said 
have you any comments, sir? And he said, yes, I have. He said, I am very surprised to be in a bomber command aircraft being flown by a naval officer. <laughs> that was all I ever got out of him. That's somebody's teeth, isn't it? <laughs> there we go. Anyway, let's move on. Um, another difficult time for Britain, and many, some of you, I have no idea your ages, of course, some of you may re recollect the era of the V1 and the V2. Well, the V1, of course, was the first problem Britain had in the summer of 44. Flying bomb came over the British coast, normally at between one and 2,000 feet, at a steady, very steady, 400 miles an hour. Now, we had all the fighters and fighter command lined up to deal with it, but, and these included the Spitfire 14, the Tempest 5, the Mosquito 6, and the Mustang, the Mustang 3 at that time. None of these aircraft could achieve 400 miles an hour at low level. They could all do it up at 20, 25,000, not at low level. So it was decided we would boost the engines, a bit of a risk than this, but instead of 100 octane fuel, we would use 150 octane aromatic fuel which gave a large power boost and I was doing the Tempest 5 on an evening in August, 26th of August which was last weekend and um, after we had to take a few risks I was told to do at least three runs for Normally, the engine had to be checked after one run. Now, my third run, the engine seized and caught fire. So I bailed out. That wasn't difficult at all. Not really. And um, what followed was ridiculous. I was so busy watching the tempest because it was circling overhead me. And um, I landed in a duck pond, a very slimy duck pond. And as we say in the Navy, when I pulled in my parachute, etc., and waited for the nearest shore, there I was met by a very ferocious looking bull. I think you'd just come back from Madrid. I haven't been on a course down there because he had all the body language, legs spread, head down, steam coming out both nostrils, pouring the gun. He looked very ferocious, I assure you. Ferocious enough to make me do a 190 back to the opposite shore. But this was no fool, I remember he'd been on a course. When I got round there, he was waiting for me there. So, but this time, the emergency services had arrived. Ambulance, fire, police, even Dad's army. But all looking over the hedge. Nobody prepared to win a George medal. And finally I called out to them, fetch the farmer. So after quite a pause, the son of the soil arrived and walked down to the bull, put his two fingers through the, the ring in its nose and said, come on, Ferdinand, and off the two of them trotted. <laughs> so the emergency services then went into action. Just another thing I haven't forgotten much. <laughs> now what about 
the best, the best and the worst aircraft I've ever flown. I'll tell you about the best later. But about the worst, there was a glider. There we go. Glider called the General Aircraft um, GAL, and what was it, 56. This was experimental when we were playing with the effects of sweepback wings, and the various ones were built with various degrees of sweepback. And this thing had been checked in the wind tunnels and showed very, very adverse flying characteristics. So, unusually, the aircraft company, General Aircraft, were not asked to test the aircraft themselves, but handed it straight over to Farnborough. Since I was head of aerodynamics flight at that time, it was incumbent upon me to fly it. Well, how bad was it? Well, let me tell you this. I flew it 19 times. Why 19? Because we had 19 flight observers at Farnborough, none of them would fly twice with me. <laughs> but this thing, when you try to stall it, normally stall around about 14 degrees attitude, um, as you got up to about 12 and a half degrees, suddenly the stick would come back and there was nothing you could do to force it forward. It would come right back. The aircraft would then reel up, literally go over the top backwards, and then into a tail slide. Now, when you get in a tail slide, and I had plenty of advice from Poffins on this, under no circumstances must you try and get it out of the tail slide. The only thing to do is sit back and think of England and um, let it go until eventually, as it slides back, it will eventually flop forward or flop over, but anyway, but usually forward. Now, we finished the trials because, as I say, only 19 efforts were made and took it back to General Aircraft's chief test pilot, who was a very famous former German glider pilot called Robert Kronfeldt. And Robert Kronfeldt was based at Lasham. I flew it down there, gave him a full briefing on it, and I explained what I had been advised to do and not touch anything in the tail slide. Here he was, a very experienced glider pilot. He was a bit skeptical about this. Anyway, he was left to his own devices and a few flights after that I heard he had finally got into a tail slide and was killed. His observer fortunately managed to bail out, but um, he stuck with it, trying wrestling with the console still, left it too late. So that is probably the worst aircraft I've flown. Right now, um, let's change a minute for the helicopter boys for just a minute. Again, 44. I was sitting at Farnborough. The only helicopter I'd ever seen is the one I showed you with Hannah Reich in Germany. But we had word that two helicopters had been shipped to Liverpool for the REE, and would I go and collect them? I went with Martindale, the guy who did 0.92 in the spit, 
He was a big guy, too. Anyway, we arrived there, found two master sergeants, uh, putting these things together, the R4B, and uh, I said to one of them, where's the instructor? And he handed me a buff boot, which I have to this day, buff colored boot. And he said, there's your instructor, bud. So we each got our boot and went off to our Nissen hut and sat having a pretty miserable evening reading it all up. And as we sat there, I always remember Martindale turned to me and said, do you know, this is like reading your own obituary. <laughs> now I was a bit more optimistic because I had seen pictures of Igor Sikorsky with his fedora hat on, flying in one of these helicopters, sitting there, as I say, with his hat on, having a good flight round. And I thought, well, if that old so-and-so can do it, so can I. But how wrong I was, because what I didn't know was that he would, did all his early flights tethered until he got the control, a feel of the controls, which are so different, certainly were in those days. Whereas with fixed wing aircraft, you need a fair movement to get any response. With these helicopters, it was tiny movements to get quite a, a quick response. So we had to learn the hard way. But nevertheless, I flew 7,000 hours in the helicopters and thoroughly enjoyed them. Uh, they're very, very fond of them indeed. Right, next one please. At this time, in late 1944, Britain got the shakes because the Germans suddenly released some very, very nasty weapons. I've talked about the V1. They also shortly afterwards released the V2, the supersonic bomb. And at the same time, we had reports that they were flying jet aircraft and rocket aircraft. So Winston Churchill said to the director of the RE, who was then called Farron, said, set up a mission and go to Germany as soon as the peace occurs. First thing, you must have three priorities. Priority number one, find and try and bring back, if possible, their supersonic wind tunnels. Because in Britain, America and France, there were no supersonic wind tunnels. There were, we knew at least seven in Germany, and one very good one in Italy, but allies had none. That was first priority. Second was find, and if they have not been damaged, fly their rocket and jet aircraft and give us assessments. Thirdly, find their top scientists and pilots, test pilots, interrogate them, and if we, you think they have much to offer, bring them back to Britain. Well, we found they had seven... Now, now before I tell this, uh, let me say this. At the capitulation, when Germany capitulated, Germany was divided into three occupation zones. Now, this had been decided pre-capitulation, but took place on the day. 
Before the capitulation, the Americans, Russians, ourselves, allies. Day after the capitulation, competitors. And uh, we were very fortunate in having the best area of the lot to find what we were looking for. Britain had the western part of Germany, Russia the north, um, the Americans the south, and the French, I don't know, what, we didn't worry much about that. <laughs> but um, anyway, at the end of the day, we had three research centres in which we found seven supersonic wind tunnels. In the event, we didn't dismantle them all. We took details of how they worked and slightly improved on them and then set them up in the UK. But to give you an idea, these wind tunnels had a, a Mach number stream of about 1.2. But we found one in the American zone at a tiny village in Bavaria with a stream of Mach 4.4. Unbelievable. And this had originally been designed and built by Werner von Braun. And he installed it at Penemunde. But then when the bomber command began to bomb Penemunde to bits, he had it transferred down to this Bavarian village. To this day, that wind tunnel is working. The Americans took it lock, stock and barrel to Maryland and there it still operates with a, map, a stream of 4.4. Quite, quite incredible. So, that's how we did with the wind tunnels. Uh, with the aircraft, here is the first jet we wanted and got. This is the Messerschmitt 262, the most formidable aircraft of World War II. Look at the fuselage, shaped like a shark. The result of using, finding that shape in the supersonic wind tunnels. Swept wings, jet engines, which were not like the British ones, based on the centrifugal principle, but based on the, no, what is it? Axial flow, thank you. Axial flow principle, yes. And I said to Frank Whittle, who I worked with a while, Frank, why did you go axial, oh, sorry, centrifugal, when the others, Germans, went axial? And he said, for the simple reason, I wanted to give the RAF, the first jet engine, one of simplicity and reliability. Now, how right he was, because the first Whittle engine had an overhaul life of 100 hours. The Germans, with these axial flow engines, two of them there, had a scrap life of 25 hours. And their engines were extremely difficult to operate. In fact, so much so that at the end of the war, Adolf Galland told me that um, I went on a lecture tour with him, so I had long conversations with him. And he said that when he had JG-44 at the end of the war, with 262s, the engines were so sensitive, liable to fail, that he told his pilots, take off at full power, reduce the climbing speed, never touch them thereafter, until you land. Fine, they didn't flame out or anything, but what it did reduce was the scrap life from 25 hours to 12 and a half. 
so you don't get something for nothing. Why was this other thing about it? Of course, a 430 millimeter cannon in this aircraft. Now, how good was it? Well, I checked it against the Spit 14. The Spit 14 had a top speed of 446 miles an hour. 446. When I checked this one out, top speed of 568. 125 miles an hour, faster than the fastest Allied fight. If they hadn't run out of pilots and run out of fuel, this could have been a big headache for the Allies. Could have prolonged the war, possibly as much as a couple of years. But they were short of the other vital factors. Grab next. The other aircraft of interest was the Rocket 163. Full of innovations, it's uh, landing on a skid. The wheels there are merely a trolley for takeoff, which has to be jettisoned. Then underneath, you have a rocket motor and uh, swept wings, 22 and a half degrees of sweep, two 30 millimeter cannon. Not much fun for the pilot because this is a 600 mile an hour airplane, but the max bailout speed is 250 miles an hour. So you are in a tin coffin when you get into this airplane. When the one, I only did one powered flight in it, and believe in me, it was enough. <laughs> but whereas we had been used with, to our fighters of climb speeds of maybe 250 miles an hour, 3,000, 3,500 feet a minute, but this rocket motor had three throttleable positions, idle, climb, or cruise rather, and full power. You had to be pretty nippy if you let your thoughts go away from what you were doing. Uh, once you got to height and leveled off, if you didn't throttle back, you'd quickly get into compressibility problems and at a Mach number of 8.4, this aircraft tucked under, nose dropped severely, and there was no way out. You could make a, make a hole in the ground. The main thing that concerned me was, I found out that um, the Germans had 42 fatal accidents landing. Reason being, the fuels in this aircraft were highly volatile. And uh, one was concentrated hydrogen peroxide, the other hydrogen hydrate and methanol as the catalyst. And if there was as much as a wine glass full of uh, fuel left, for landing. You had a jettison system, but to get rid of every last drop is difficult. So I said if you had as much as half a wine glass full on impact on the skids on landing, the aircraft would blow up. And 42 such cases, all in all cases, fatal. So it was a very dicey airplane. I call it a tool of desperation. Its operational record not very good. It's down a combination of 16 Allied aircraft and lost 10 itself. Because once the f you've um, burnt your fuel out, you're gliding home, of course. You are very vulnerable during that phase. 
Right. How much time have we got, Jock? Very quickly, I'm going to show you another thing. That is a, an error curve for landing on a carrier. Well, what was I doing landing in the error curve on a carrier? The thing was, we were coming into the era of nose wheels. And when you land on an aircraft, an aircraft on a carrier, once it's arrested, then of course the nose pitches forward quite heavily. And the nose wheel can be compressed uh, to a degree where it might collapse. So we tried the Aero Cobra because as you see, it has a very long nose wheel and um, we found out that all was well. The problem with the Aero Cobra was it was a bit short of power for takeoff and you thundered down the deck with the nose wheel firmly on the, on the deck the whole way until it fell off the front and uh, probably it lost about 10 feet in height before it picked up and went, and went away. Right, could we go on to the next, please? Now, you've asked me, or somebody has, what was my favourite aircraft? There it is, the de Havilland Hornet, successor of the Mosquito, Single engine, handed props, light, very powerful. The main thing about this airplane was it was overpowered, which is a rarity in aviation. But you could do anything on one engine, almost anything you could do on two. A remarkable airplane. Next one. Ah, right, now we come to the first landing of a jet aircraft on an aircraft carrier. We were in very, what should I say, serious contention with the Americans about who was going to get there first. And um, the guy who was doing it had been my flight commander when I was in America. And um, there was a problem we ran into, and the problem was this. In the early jets, the rate of acceleration of power with opening the throttle was incredibly slow. You saw the little E2839. Um, that and the Vampire both, and the German jets also, and the American jets, the whole lot, had poor acceleration. If you sat with the brakes on and opened up the throttle to full power before you released the brakes and went, it took 15 seconds. And of course, this is all very well, except if you're landing and you suddenly get into a bit of bother and you need power quickly. Now the whole essence of deck landing is lift control. There is a difference between piston engine and jets. With a piston engine aircraft, if you want lift suddenly, all you do is whack the throttle forward, you get huge slipstream from the propellers, and you get lift. If you want drag, you pull the throttle back, the who changes pitch, and you get your drag. With a jet, the only way of getting lift is acceler speed acceleration, and the only way of getting drag is have dive brakes. So the two are quite different. In our hurry to get the first aircraft 
on a carrier um, you may notice that the aircraft carrier is rolling slightly and pitching slightly. So it wasn't ideal conditions, but all went well, and you'll see the takeoff here. Or the landing, isn't it? Yes, the landing. Actually, I caught the very first wire. Now, that's not a terribly clever thing to do. Uh, you usually should go for a wire number three or four. But the pitching at the rear was difficult to judge. And when, just as I came over, the stern was on the rise. And um, so I caught number one wire. Right, can we go on to the next one? Now this experiment of landing on a rubber deck, you've probably heard of. And the reasons for it were to get rid of the weight of the huge undercarriage, or the heavy undercarriage you need on a naval aircraft, which amounts to 7% of the all up weight. So if you get rid of 7%, you can make that up in fuel, weapons, or whatever. The reason it didn't work out was when you've done this, and we did 200 landings with a, all kinds of pilots from above average to below average, 200, and we didn't have a single accident. Um, once I had eased the bugs out of the system. And um, show the next one, would you? That's it catching the wire. There it is with the wire attached. And there it is flopping onto the deck. Now, what was meant to be done then was you see, the deck has been hosed down to reduce the coefficient of friction. And you, since there is only one arrestor wire, you know the aircraft will always finish up at the same spot if you retract the wire and pull it back. So you pull it back till it's over a trap door, trap door slides down and it slides onto a trolley. That way you can have twice their fighter complement on a carrier than you could have otherwise. But the biggest thing that came out of this was not that, but here was the biggest thing. The angled deck. Because while we were discussing how to operate the flexible deck at the same time as we were catapulting, uh, we just, somebody doodled on a piece of paper and without offering it up as the solution, fortunately was spotted by the head of Naval Aircraft Department, a farmer, who thought, my God, there's a potential here. And he dreamt up the angled deck, which I think I can say safely has saved naval aviation. We handed it over willingly to the United States. I took it over, gave it to the Bureau of Aeronautics, and um, with their usual speed of action, they had a proper, not just a painted, but a proper flexible deck going within months. Right, the next slide, I'm not going to go much further now. That is the most, I would think, dangerous aircraft I've ever flown. It was a serial killer. Three built, three fatal accidents. Um, mine was 
I didn't have an accident with it, but I almost had a fatal uh, experience with it. It was based on the German Messerschmitt 163. The idea was to have this short, heavily swept back tailless, well when I say tailless, has a vertical tail but no horizontal tail. The problem was the Havilands went to Germany, saw the 163, dreamt up the idea but did not consult the designer of the 163. Otherwise he'd have warned them they had the center of gravity too far aft. And as a result, in testing, it picked up a dreadful longitudinal oscillation if it got into the slightest bit of rough air or the pilot inadvertently moved, jerked a stick. Um, Jeffrey de Havilland was killed on the first one while practicing for um, an attempt on the world speed record. When we found his body, we realized his neck had been broken in flight. How had this happened? Well, Jeffrey was um, six feet two and um, the aircraft had a very violent oscillation and we believe, or we believe then, that his head had been snapped back and forth and eventually struck the top of the canopy which broke his neck. With no proof, so it was decided to do accident investigation. Again, I was chosen for this because I was head of aeroflight. And it's up to me to do it. And um, we did everything that Jeffrey had done, copied everything. And we got a similar, similar oscillation. And um, I was going faster and lower than Jeffrey had gone. So I thought, right, when I realized I couldn't control this oscillation, and the big change was the aircraft had an ejection seat, which Jeffrey did not have. So I decided to reach up and get the, pull the blind, but I was under such G that um, I, my hands, I, I couldn't lift them up to get the blind. So we had to let it go all the way. They're ejecting as well. There's a bus got to go. Pardon? There's a bus got to go. Oh, a bus. It's our sincere apologies. It's all right, you've got a bus. Thank you very much indeed. I'm just literally finishing. So the Bristol group is now fine. Good night, everybody. Thank you very much. Anyway, the DH-108 killed another two of my pilots in aeroflight. Uh, it almost got me, but um, a very, very difficult airplane to fly because the designers had got the center of gravity wrong. Now, as a, as a finale, <clears throat> um, let me tell you about the interrogation I had of Hermann Goering. At the end of the war, this came about because um, the Americans were doing in their occupation zone what I was doing in ours. 
But we had many more jet aircraft than they had. And they came begging uh, to get some from us. And we were quite generous to them. But finally they came again and said they'd like a couple of extra Arado 234s, which was the photographic reconnaissance aircraft. And uh, we had plenty of those, but I hummed and hawed about it because I thought I can do a deal here. And uh, so I said to the American, um, yeah, maybe we can do this, but uh, what about agreement that's a quid pro quo? We'll give you two Arados and you let us have interrogation rights with Goering. He said, oh, I don't know if I can do that. And I said, well, ask your bosses, because you seem to be very much in their favor. Anyway, it was granted. And on the 16th of June, I went to interrogate him in Luxembourg. And it was very interesting because um, he came into the interrogation room. It was just a table, myself at one side, he would stand at the other, and there was an American, what they called invigilating officer, sitting, a German-speaking lawyer, sitting there because they said, you are not allowed to ask Goering any political questions. We will do that at Nuremberg. You must stick to aviation questions only. So, uh, I asked him a long number, but let me tell you the main one I asked him. I said, uh, what do you consider was the outcome of the Battle of Britain? And he thought for a minute and then said, a draw. I thought, the RAF won't like this. <laughs> but um, anyway, I said, how did you arrive at that conclusion? And he and was very intelligent in his reply. He said, if you look at the analysis of the Battle of Britain, you will see that in the last week of the battle, Germany suddenly were in the ascendancy. RAF lost more aircraft, more pirates than we had for the first time in the battle. Now I have looked this up and you can do so yourselves. You'll find this is absolutely true. And he said, so, he said, since we hadn't lost at this stage. I call it a draw because we had to withdraw because Hitler called back all fighter units to prepare for the invasion of Russia. This also is perfectly true. And right at the end, I thought, I asked him many more questions. And when we finished, I, to my surprise, he came over and stuck his hand out. Now, there was no way I could shake Goering's hand, particularly with an American sitting there. And um, so I thought, the hell do I do now? And then I thought, of Ernst Udet, right back in 1936. And I thought, ah, the F World War I fighter pilots greeting, Haus and Beinbuch. So I said that to Goering, and he half smiled, lowered his hand, just went off. And then, of course, I said to the Americans at the end of it, he doesn't look to me like a man who's afraid of suffering an ignominious death by hanging, as almost certainly he will be sentenced to. But 
they paid no attention. And what happened, of course, at the end, very quickly, was all the prisoners in Nuremberg jail were allowed one suitcase with their personal belongings in it. And these were all stored in one storeroom and the duty officer had the key each night. And a young Texan lieutenant was a bit bemused by Goering, always saluted him, called him Marshal, and Goering played on this boy, gave him a beautiful watch, and after he'd been sentenced to be hung at Nuremberg, when this boy came, was on duty, he called him and said to him, uh, look, could you do me a tiny favor? He said, I've got a niche on the side of my face, and if you go into my suitcase, there'll be, there's a pot of cream which will soothe us. This young man did just that, brought the pot of cream, and in the cream, of course, was a cyanide pill. And Goering took it, and that was that. Similarly, again, really, this is really the final story. Himmler, when I was asked to identify Himmler at the end, I wasn't allowed to interrogate him. I was allowed to ask him some key questions which would prove he was Himmler. And he was a very nasty piece of work. Anyway, I, at the end of it all, I said to the Second Army Intelligence people, I am totally convinced this is Himmler. So they said, right, we'll take him to headquarters. So I drove to headquarters, which was only 20 odd miles away. And as they took him to the, through the front door, the doctor, and headquarters moved forward, said, open your mouth, and put two fingers in Himmler's mouth. Himmler bit on the fingers, not in a nasty way, but merely to crunch the cyanide pill he had hidden in a tooth cavity. And uh, 10 seconds, he was dead. And then we had to report this back to Britain, and they came back and said, right, bury him tonight. Take him out in a wooden box, go a zigzag course through Lüneburg Heath, so that the, the four people carrying the box and the young captain leading him will not recollect where he was put, then find their way back. They did this. And to this day, his body has not been found. Although if you go to Lüneburg Heath on a Sunday, the Germans are there with their buckets and spades digging for him, himless bones. So far, no luck. But you see the sense in doing this. We have prevented an icon of a new Nazi being formed. So there you are. The only thing I haven't talked to you about and I think you can do without it, is the release of Belson concentration camp. You can read about that in my book. Horror, 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 nothing else. Thank you very much.